session about uh, thematic services for the social sciences and humanities. It's being co-organized by EOSCAP and uh, SHOP project. Uh, chairs of today are Deborah Testi and myself. Um, we, if you look at the agenda, we will be discussing one, two, three, four thematic services, services that played a role in EOSCAP, uh, partly, uh, but also partly in the shop project. So it will be interesting to compare uh, what can be achieved with uh, those services in the respective uh, uh, projects. Um, I myself will present a uh, presentation uh, trying to sum up a bit about what, uh, what has been achieved with the uh, different uh, services and uh, how we could uh, uh, maybe use uh, the resources that are available in the different projects better to reach out and uh, uh, involve a, uh, a number of, say, the, the best number of, uh, of uh, end users. We'll have a discussion at the end that will be moderated uh, by Deborah. So Deborah, will you introduce then the speakers? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, our first speaker is uh, um, Emmanuel Dima from University of Tunimbeng and it will give a presentation related to the uh, shock switchboard. Uh, Emmanuel, do you want to share your slide? Yeah, then I should start sharing the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. You should okay, see it perfect. right now. Yep. Okay. Um, hi everybody, I'm Emmanuel Dima from the University of Tübingen and uh, I am going to present you the story of the switchboard, uh, the stabilization and the enhancements that it went through in EOS Hub and the shock projects. First, let me tell you what is a switchboard. Uh, it is a web application which acts as a broker between the data sets on one side and uh, the data processing tools on the other side. So given um, a piece of data that uh, the user provides either directly or maybe it comes from a repository, the switchboard can display a list of tools that match that piece of data and can send the user to the tool that the user chooses. Um, all the data sets and the tools are external to the switchboard. So it, the switchboard itself, it's only a mediator between the data and the tools. Um, it has no state. Uh, and it, the switchboard tries to determine um, the tool that can process a particular input data and uh, to, to, to show a nice user interface. Um, and that brings advantages to the user because the switchboard hides the complexities involved in transferring the data to the tools. And um, for most of the tools, the data processing can start immediately with almost no parameterization um, it's very convenient for the users to just click and start the tool directly. If you haven't tried it already, um, the switchboard is available at switchboard.clarin.eu. It's very nice to play a bit with it. Um, the project was created by Klaus Zinn at the University of Tübingen. Uh, it started back in 2015 in the Clarin project. I think it was Clarin Plus, right? back then, a uh, continuation of Clarin. And then it continued after EOS Hub. Um, and from 2019, Klaustin decided to go to the University of uh, Constance for a while. So that's when I came and um, started maintaining the project. Uh, I was also funded by EOS Hub and Shock. You can see here uh, the first commit on the left side. This, uh, these are screenshots pro, from uh, an open source uh, tool, which is called GORS, which presents the development, um, the history of development uh, given a particular Git repository. Um, it has a full movie, but I only um, was able to include a few screenshots here. 
Uh, the first commit on the left happened in December 2015, and the commit on the right, uh, the, the picture on the right describes the state of the repository in August 2017, the date of the release. It was back then a React JavaScript application. It had a small node backend. Um, the user data was hosted initially on a dedicated server in Garhin. Um, then it was moved on a dedicated on cloud instance here in Tübingen. Um, I said initially that users, the data is not stored in the switchboard, but the switchboard keeps a very a temporary copy of the data. That's why we need a bit of hosting. And uh, back then the tool definitions, so uh, the, the piece of JSON that describes each tool were all stored in one big JSON file. It was a different era. Slowly uh, the switchboard um, matured you can see on the left the user interface as it looks looked like in March uh, 2018. Um, this is the upload screen where the user can provide the data by uploading it from the local computer. Um, or it can also provide a link to the data or it can input the data directly as text. And there is a, a fourth way which is not depicted here which um, involves coming to the switchboard from a repository. So from a piece of data, as you see it in the repository directly. Um, during 2018, a few releases, minor releases of the switchboard have uh, been done. They were all hosted on the Clarin EU uh, at the same address as it is today, switchboard.clarin.eu. This is the production instance. And uh, yeah, here on the right, you can see um, the state of the branch uh, of the repository in April 2019. You can th see three persons right there. It's Klaus Zinn and also Andre Moreira and Juan Guzin, which were providing help. Um, the nicest way to get to the switchboard is coming from a repository. And in version one, the switchboard had integration with the VLO, VCR, B2Drop, and Partners D4 Science. Um, these are all repositories um, where you can see some data, where you have a piece of data, a file usually. You have some kind of context menu. So you go, go into the context menu and somewhere inside there is a link to the switchboard, either a process with the language resource switchboard link in the VLO and VC, VCR. In B2Drop, B2Drop was developed uh, in UDAT, in the UDAT project. Here you can see a switchboard link. And in Partenos, D4 Science, there is a send to switchboard link. Um, there is also support for Dropbox data because the users sometimes have data in Dropbox and they want to provide just a link to it. Um, the switchboard supported uh, this kind of uh, uh, data input mechanism back then. And it had a collection of almost 70 tools in the NLP domain, the natural language processing domain. Um, in 2019, I came to the project and I started maintaining it and I realized that the switchboard had grown too quickly and had a lot of technical depth, so I had to do a bit of restructuring. Um, the React.js front-end was kept as, as a component, but was entirely rewritten. And the back-end, which was in three different, three or four different parts, so Node.js, own cloud, and some Python scripts, and also an Apache uh, or Nginx, I'm not sure, uh, front-end, uh, a server. Uh, these were combined in a single component, uh, which is now a Java backend. Um, now it's all packed in a Docker container, so it's much easier to install for production or testing. You can see how it looks like in version two, the same screen of inputting the data. It's version 2.2.2, .2 .2, which is the most recent one. 
uh, it looks a bit nicer in the, as a, the, a user interface. And on the right, you can see how the repository looks like. Um, a bit more complex, a bit more structured, and uh, it's also missing some components because the profiler, the data profiler, has been moved into a different, a separate Git repository. Uh, during 2019 and 2020, we released version 2, 2.1, 2.2, and we are working to release 2.3 with a lot of enhancements. And these enhancements have been driven mostly by the shock requirements. We came from an NLP background and the tools were adjusted for the NLP requirements, but now we are trying to enlarge the community and to cater to the larger social science community. Um, what are these enhancements? We, uh, as I said before, we externalize the data profiler. It's now able to recognize subtypes of XML data like TI, Folia, and TCF. Um, <clears throat> also, Connell U, which is a columnary type. Uh, we move the tool descriptions from a single JSON file into a separate Git repository, and each tool now has a separate JSON file, and that allows for a very nice distributed pipeline. Um, anybody can add a tool can make a pull request into the Git repository, and then the pull request is verified automatically. We have a JSON schema and so on, and can be merged with a production or beta instance in the first uh, place. And then if it's all well, it can be merged in production. We have improved tool descriptions. We support markdown for a better and nicer user interface. We have resource caching, a new I would say very nice pop-up mode, which is um, especially made for integration with the repositories. Um, right now, when you see the switchboard link on a repository and click on it, you are being sent to a new tab in the browser, but that's not very nice. So the new pop-up mode displays the switchboard in a small window in the context of the repository. And then it's much use, easier for the user to select a tool, to start a new tool, or to dismiss the pop-up altogether and return to the repository. We have a new JSON format for specification of the tools. We support new kind of tools like dictionaries, gazetteers, geographical data, 3D visualization for archeological scans. Um, we added support for tools which require multiple inputs. And we also are able now to recommend desktop applications instead of web applications because sometimes there are desktop applications which are very important and the users must know about them. Um, we coordinated uh, with partners, with our partners, and were um, able to integrate uh, repost a few other repositories, like, like the, the text grid repository, the Deria DE repository, and Arche of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. We have a bit more tools, close to actually more than 110. Mostly, most of them are still in the NLP domain, but some of them are, are, are not, are in archaeology and dictionaries. And we have a lot of plans for the future, of course. We want to integrate with the Shock Marketplace, which is a bilateral integration. The Marketplace can harvest the tools that are described in the um, switchboard and can present them but also the marketplace has a lot of data collections. So it can send the users or present the pop-up of the switchboard uh, together in the context of the data so that the users can use the data with some tools provided by the switchboard. Um, we want to show a bit of preview for the data sets, either the content or the outline of the data we want to be able to support iterative processing of data, which is stored in collections. Um, we want to provide a way of retrieving data sets, starting from a metadata description. Um, this can be either a SIMD file. Sometimes we have a link to a landing page and, sometime, uh, and the data is buried somewhere in that landing page. We'd, we'd like to be able to retrieve the data automatically. And 
of course, we want to integrate a lot of more tools and more repositories, and we will try to do that. I think that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Emmanuel, for, for the interesting presentation. So first of all, I'd like to remember everyone that uh, you can write uh, questions uh, during the speech, uh, either in the chat or into the question and answer. But uh, you can also raise your hand and we can give you the floor to make any questions to the speakers um, after each talk. Um, so thanks, Emmanuel. I see you have already answered one of our uh, attendees question, which is one, which tool uh, you use to, to make this nice graphic yeah. presentation of the- I will put a link in the chat. I'm not sure if we have time to take questions now or later. Um, I think we can take one, one or two quick question if there are, and then we can move uh, forward. Um, is there, first of all, any question from the audience? Um, No, it seems not. I, I have a question, Emmanuel, for you. Um, so I, I think it was very interesting uh, when you mentioned that uh, you have now um, tools, uh, I mean, use of the switchboard, which is not just in the natural language domain, uh, but th that you started seeing use also in other domains. You, I think you mentioned archaeology and a few others. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think this um, will be taken up in the future more? I mean, uh, I think the switcher is, in principle, uh, can be used also maybe in other domains. Um, or you think it will be, it will stay mainly in the natural language domain service? Oh, I'm not sure <laughs> there is a way of, <laughs> of telling. <laughs> uh, we would like it to be used, of course. Um, and that's why we, we work in this direction right um, because it would be it would have been very easy to just stay in the nlp domain where we had a lot of expertise but um, we're trying our best to expand it and to provide support for these new tools and hopefully there will be somebody to use it maybe i can add to that uh, yeah. Yeah. Deborah. so it's uh, let's say it's the main aim of uh, this uh, task 36 in uh, the shock project uh, generification of uh, yeah. some clearing tools uh, to first reach out to uh, the uh, the broader uh, humanities and uh, who knows after that the world uh, so indeed, this, this, is, this is our main motivation for further developing uh, the switchboard in uh, shock. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I think we can move to the next speaker, speaker and leave any further question to the discussion session in the end. So our next speaker is uh, Willem Elbers uh, from Clarim, and he will present uh, the Shock Virtual Collection Registry. Uh, we can see already your slide, Willem, so you can start. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Willem Elbers. I'm working for the Clarin Eric, and I'm currently the, the maintainer of the Clarin Virtual Collection Registry that we're also uh, using in Shock. And that is what I will present now. So first, a little bit of background. So um, a virtual collection, uh, as we have defined it, is uh, a coherent set of links that can point basically to any object accessible over HTTP. So that can be text, video, uh, any, anything that is accessible over H HTTP. And you can basically, basically see it as uh, similar to a bookmarking um, solution. Uh, where we make sure that it's easy to, to create a collection, that it's easy uh, to access the collection, and probably most important, uh, that it's easy to cite. Uh, so we do assign persistent identifiers that can be used to, to, to reference the virtual collection. Um, what's also important is that uh, links in these collections uh, can, can span different archives. That's why we call them, call them virtual. So you can use a virtual collection uh, to basically aggregate a set of links 
uh, over, over multiple archives or, or, or data uh, repositories. Um, the virtual collections um, are suitable to access manually uh, as well as automatically. Um, manually via the, the virtual collection registry that we will talk to and uh, talk about uh, in, in the rest of the presentation and automatically either via an API where we offer uh, virtual collections in a, in a JSON format or a CMDI format or uh, via OAI PMH. So the virtual collection registry also offers an OAI PMH endpoint that can be harvested. So the virtual collection registry currently is provided by Clarin Eric and it's available at collections.clarin.eu. Uh, I should mention that the hosting provider that's currently hosting the virtual collection registry, which is uh, IDS, the Institute for the German Language, is migrating at the moment um, their, their, their um, uh, virtual machine infrastructure. So there will be some downtime either today or tomorrow, but they were not able to uh, uh, provide a, a specific uh, time slot. So it should be accessible, but uh, if, if it's not available, uh, it's, it, it's expected to, to take about five minutes. So the, the virtual collection registry was originally uh, developed by the IDS several years ago. Uh, and currently is, is actively developed and maintained centrally by the, by the Claren Eric. Um, all the development work is, is funded and supported uh, both by, by Claren Eric and various projects originally uh, uh, for, from Claren and, and the Claren Plus project. Um, and uh, for, for, the, for the past couple of years also within the EOS Hub uh, project, uh, the virtual collection registry has been offered as, as a thematic service. And within Shock, we are currently working on um, expanding the support for different communities uh, um, that, that can make use of the of, of virtual collections and the virtual collection registry. It is open source, so uh, please have a look at the GitHub repository. And if you have any suggestions, uh, feel free to, to, make, uh, to make issues uh, with, with feature requests. So for every virtual collection, we collect um, a minimum amount of, of, of metadata that's used uh, to, to describe the, the virtual collection and, and provide a little bit of, of, of context to the virtual collection. We basically try to keep the data model as generic as possible and, and not make it uh, specific to, to any data domain. Uh, basically to, to ensure that the virtual collection registry and the virtual collections uh, can be used uh, in, in, in different domains. Um, at the moment, we're also working on compatibility with uh, uh, data side DUIs. Um, as far as we, we, we know right now, the uh, metadata that we are collecting is compatible with the data side uh, DUI schema. So uh, yeah, it should not be too, too difficult to support data side DUIs in the near future. Um, so what we are currently uh, collecting is some descriptive metadata on, on the collection level. It's basically the name of the collection, a description, uh, the type of the, of the collection, uh, some information about the authors and, and, and keywords uh, indicating uh, what, what the collection is about. So we're basically supporting two types of collections. It's uh, extensional collections or intentional uh, collections. An extensional collection uh, is a collection uh, that basically describes uh, uh, a fixed set of results, a fixed set of, of, of links, while an intentional collection basically tries to capture an intention of a search query. So that's basically a collection that can return a different result uh, at any moment in time based on, uh, on, on, on the specified search query. Uh, for all the links that are included in the collection, uh, we also collect a little bit of metadata uh, describing the link, uh, a name for the link and a description for the, for, for the link. But I have an example of, of, of that uh, a bit later. All the collections uh, basically are publicly accessible as soon as they are published. Uh, however, uh, creating collections um, 
requires authentication. Um, lo login at the moment is, is possible via most Edugain IDPs. Uh, basically, the Edugain IDPs that are supported within the Clarin infrastructure. Um, if you don't have access to any of the supported IDPs, you can always create uh, an account in the, in the Clarin identity provider to get access. And after you're able to log in, you can basically create and edit collections uh, uh, that you own. And when you create a collection, it basically is, is, is private while you are working on it. Uh, and as soon as you are happy and it is, it, it, it's ready, you can publish it. Uh, as soon as you publish the collection, uh, we will mint a, a persistent identifier. And if everything is successful, it will go into the published state. And, and that's basically the moment in time where everybody can, can access your, your collection and you can use the persistent identifier to, to uh, reference the collection. Um, it is possible to edit your collection after publication. Uh, and at the moment, because we don't support versioning yet, uh, we more or less discourage this. Uh, uh, because yeah, that will basically mean that the the especially if, if you if you use the the collection in in, in publications, uh, it, it, you can basically change uh, whatever it, it is pointing to. So this is basically a screenshot of the of the main page of the virtual collection registry. What you can see here is a list of all the public collections. Uh, you can also see if you are logged in or not. Uh, currently, I'm in, in the screenshot. I, I I have logged in. If you click on a collection and you want to uh, see the details, uh, you will. Uh, Go, go into into this screen and what you see here is all the descriptive metadata or, uh, that we collect on the collection. Uh, this collection was created to uh, uh, basically offer a set of COVID-19 related uh, um, articles that, that, that were published in, in PubMed. As you can see, there's a handle that, that has been assigned and there's an easy citation button that you can use to get some uh, pointers on, on, on how, to, how to cite this collection. The screen basically, uh, or the, the, the details of the collection basically continue with a list of all the uh, resources that the collection points to. And as you can see, there's a, the, uh, a label of the, uh, of the reference and a description. There's also a small button with actions, uh, and that's a, a similar to what Emmanuel showed. If you click on this button, you will get, for example, the option to open this uh, resource in the uh, switchboard. So that was a short overview of the current state of the, of the virtual collection registry. Um, we have been working on this uh, service within EOSCUP. Our main focus in, uh, in the EOSCUP project was to, to work on the integrations that we already had between the virtual collection registry and the switchboard and the virtual language observatory. Um, so for the integration with the switchboard, it was basically uh, how uh, opening one of the resources that the collection points to uh, and sending it to the switchboard for processing with with, with uh, potential tools for the vlo it was uh, the, the integration was set up so that based on a search result in the vlo if you're, you're you're happy with the search result you can click on a button and you can with one click on the button create a, a virtual collection based on on those results um under the EOSCA project, we also worked on improving the, the endpoint that we used for these kind of, of, of integrations. Uh, initially, um, we implemented this as a simple uh, HTTP endpoint where you would send a post request with some basic parameters and that would basically create the, the collection uh, and, and add all the all the resources, but under the EOSCUP we invest, uh, project, we investigated also how to integrate with, for example, B2Share. And there, one of the requirements was to be able to add more detailed information uh, via this endpoint. So now we also support uh, sending JSON uh, encoded uh, values in, in, in these post parameters. And you can basically use this endpoint to 
build a, a, a full uh, full collection. Um, one of the reasons for implementing this with a post from a data catalog to the virtual collection registry that will basically cause you to to leave the context of the of the data repository was the requirement of, of authentication on the virtual collection registry site. So this, this is all um, uh, SAML based, Shibboleth based, and it will require uh, user agent uh, interaction. So it was not possible to do this, uh, not easily possible to do this via an API or, or via uh, via backend. Currently, we are still waiting on integration with B2Share. It is scheduled uh, for early 2021, but at the moment, uh, it depends on the B2Share team priorities. Within Shock, we have been discussing possible use cases with a couple of communities. It was Eris, Sesda, and Daria. And based on the discussions that we had with these communities, we defined uh, a couple of generic use cases um, that were applicable to two to or all of the communities uh, uh, that we had discussions with. The first use case was the classical scenario where we use uh, the virtual collections uh, to create uh, bookmarks and uh, share these bookmarks mar marks in publications. But based on the discussions, we basically got a couple of, of new requirements. It, one, one of them was versioning. So it would be really nice if we can version collections. So you're working on, on, uh, uh, on, on a collection and it's published, so you can use it to, to, to cite in a, in, a, in, a, in a publication. But at some point, the, you want to update the, the, the links in the collection. And it would be nice if we can create a new version and still keep the old um, uh, old reference available with some information that a new version is available that, that has been updated. Uh, we do want to make the distinction between versioning and forking, where we basically see versioning of a collection is where the same author um, updates the collection and, and basically creates a new version, a new iteration of, of the same collection, while forking basically is somebody else taking um, a collection from a different per, uh, author as input and basically creating a new collection uh, based based on, on, on this other collection. Um, and another feature that, that uh, came up du during these discussions was the uh, need for collaborative editing. So currently, uh, there's only one uh, author of a collection that, that, that can edit a collection. It would be really nice if we can make this uh, possible to, 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 to edit a collection with, with multiple people. So we have to come up with some, uh, some kind of system to invite other people to, to into a, a, a collection, either by username or, or group uh, permissions. Um, and it would also be nice to, to, to uh, allow these invites based on, on unique links. Another um, use case that, 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 that we extracted from the discussions was to make virtual collections interoperable with other services. I'm not sure if I like the, the, the phrasing of this sentence, since I think the collections are already uh, intero interoperable uh, to some extent, but we can probably improve this. And one of the ways that, 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 that uh, we found in these discussions was uh, the requirement to, uh, for example, extend the metadata model. So currently the model is, is, is generic and it can probably be a good enhancement to, to allow more, more detailed uh, extensions to the metadata models specific for, for certain domains. Those should be optional um, and that can probably improve the, the interoperability with, with community specific services. And the third use case that we defined was uh, saving query results in virtual collections, which is uh, the saving a single query result in a virtual collection is already possible, but it would be nice to support this in, in an incremental 
way. So for example, you go to the VLO based on the search result, you create a virtual collection. Uh, and then the next step, you, for example, go to B to share, you find another set of, of, of results that you basically want to add to this collection that you initially created based on the VLO search results. Um, so yeah, that we basically have to support adding results uh, that come from a third party portal or data catalog to an existing collection. That's currently not possible. You can only create new collections uh, from these search results. Um, and an, another way to, uh, to allow these kind of interactions uh, is to add support for token-based uh, authentication to the API. The, the, the REST API currently only supports uh, basic authentication. Uh, but if we can add support for token-based authentications, a data portal backend can, can, can use a token to, to authenticate into the API and probably uh, edit the, the, the collection to, to add more results. So to summarize, um, the current virtual collection registry is, is a mature service that is offered centrally by Clara and Eric to manage sets, uh, sets of links um, across uh, data repositories for easy access and citation. Um, the service is currently offered within the EOS Cup project as a thematic service. Uh, and within Shock, we have been working on collecting use cases um, to basically get a set of feature requests shared by multiple communities that we can use to, to, to further increase the usefulness of the virtual collection registry. So we, at the moment, we, are, we basically have set three, uh, three milestones. On the short term, there's the 1.5 release where we're basically focusing on various usability improvements and adding DUI support. Uh, the next milestone is uh, related to, to the shock project where we basically uh, will implement most of the features uh, that were discussed here that, 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 that we extracted from the discussions with the communities. And further down the road, there's a 2.0 release. Um, still has to be decided what, the, what we will do there, but possibilities are working on a new data model. Uh, working on a new UI framework and totally completely updating the, the API. So that was basically my pre uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Willem, uh, for the interesting overview of the virtual collection. Is there any any question for for Willem? I remember you that you can use the chat or also raise your hand if you want to, to speak and then we will give you the floor. Seems there are no immediate questions for you, Willem. So okay. I have one, but I would prefer to keep this for the discussion because maybe mm. it's uh, a question that also the other can can answer. So I, I will yep, keep it fine. for later. Um, okay, thank you a lot, William, for the moment. Uh, our next speaker is then uh, Pavel Stranak from uh, the Charles University. Uh, Pavel, can you share your screen? Uh, I hope you can see my screen now. Uh, yeah, and now I can also hear you. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, hello, my name is Pavel Straniak. I'm from Charles University. So here, uh, within the shock, uh, we are under the Clarin partner, and within the Clarin, uh, Eric uh, Charles University is part of. Well, I'll I'll say this in a moment. Um, I will be presenting the service called UDPipe. Uh, which is an NLP web application and, and uh, we provide it as a web service. Um, and um, 
I just want to say uh, happy International Students Day. So UDPipe as an NLP service uh, provided by lindatclaria.cz. So lindatclaria.cz is a, is a Czech uh, center that is part of both Clarin and Daria Herix. And it's a consortium of many partners. And one of the partners is Charles University. And uh, we work at the School of Computer Science uh, Institute of Formal and Applied Linguistics at the Charles University. We are coordinators of the LINDAT uh, project. And uh, since our institute is uh, kind of language technology uh, oriented, uh, we provide uh, data repository and also natural language processing services uh, for the whole consortium. And the services are aimed at both language technology and also um, social sciences and humanities research um, in general. So we believe that the same service and same application can be provided uh, to both uh, professionals from language technology and from social sciences and humanities who just want to use language technology as a tool uh, in their own research. And we provide uh, all kinds of services, um, machine translation, for instance, uh, linguistic analysis uh, via UD5 that I will present uh, here and, uh, and other services like tagging of uh, named entities, uh, you know, person names and place names and numbers and things like that. And there's a list of services on our website. Um, so UDPipe itself, uh, it's, it has the pipe in the name. So it's a software for analyzing structures of natural language text. You know, originally it was a pipeline. That's, that's why it has a pipe in the name, but it's not a pipeline anymore. It's, um, it now is now it does the various tasks tagging morphological analysis uh, and parsing of natural language uh, as, a, as a joint task so it's trained uh, all together at once so UD5 version one was a very different piece of software technically than the UD5 uh, we are running currently so originally it was a self-contained tool that you could run on any computer and even on your laptop it would run very fast using only the CPU, but those days are gone. Um, with the current deep neural networks and contextual embeddings, uh, it, um, it, it takes a lot of um, machine processing power to, to train these networks. Uh, so even with the big GPUs, it takes several weeks to train the models for UD pipe. And it also takes um, quite some, some power to even, even run the inference. So, um, so even running the service, uh, providing the trained models, um, takes uh, quite a bit of power. So, so interestingly, the service is becoming more important. So I will, I will get to it later. Um, we are going to release it uh, as a software that you can run yourself, you know, including all the models and embeddings and installers, um, and even the REST server that we are that we are running on uh, on our side. So basically we'll have all the same things that we are running uh, and a script that will allow you to either process uh, data locally with, uh, with your installation or send it to our installation. Um, it will happen shortly, but currently, currently we have the latest version only deployed as a, as a web service and it is still not downloadable from our repository. And, um, and it's trained on so-called universal dependencies tree banks, which I will get to, get to in a moment why it's a good thing. This is what the service looks like. It's kind of a simple uh, web uh, application form-based input where you set a few things and just uh, put in some input, uh, push a button and get some output. And it also includes a REST API. So there's an API documentation and there are these buttons like try this where you can, where you can just push the button and, and in the browser you see an example of, of using the API. So let me get back to it. I, I hope that it is uh, simple enough that even people who don't know anything about programming can kind of uh, quickly understand how it works and, uh, and can use it for, for basic tasks. Uh, universal dependencies. So this is the substrate on, on which we train the models for universal dependency uh, for UD pipe. Um, this is a project for kind of consistent uh, 
annotation of, uh, of grammatic features across uh, languages, even types of languages. Um, many languages described in the same way. So uh, some languages have a very small data set, some have larger data sets, but we train models on, on all of them and provide those models uh, to the users. Um, all those three banks use uh, both unified uh, grammatical description and unified data format, that the Connell U format that uh, Emmanuel mentioned uh, in his presentation. Um, the project, the universal, universal dependencies project is kind of quite successful, I would say. So first version of the, of the project uh, released in January 2015 included 10 tree banks for 10 languages. So we trained those models and we provided uh, UD pipe tool that was able to analyze 10 different languages. Um, not, uh, not even two years later, the, the base of the tree banks grew to 70 tree banks for 50 languages. So now we were able to provide you know, language models for 50 languages. And uh, currently, November 2020, the latest release of universal dependencies includes 183, 83, 83 three, three, three tree banks, sorry, <laughs> for uh, 404 languages. Um, tree banks differ in size and text type. Uh, you can see that in the table on top right, uh, those icons represent text types. Uh, and they, they also differ in license. Some of them are more open than others. What they don't differ in is the annotation type, uh, with this small exception that some, some syntactic features are optional and not all tree banks include them. And you can see here on the uh, bottom right that there are both mainstream languages and kind of small languages. And there are even some historical languages, like there's a Hittite tree bank, um, a language that is dead for almost 3,000 years. OK. Uh, here you can see details for one language. So Italian has six different tree banks, and you can see details for one of those tree banks. So it says how, how large the tree bank is, and it says that the data is um, from legal domain, from news, and from Wikipedia, and there are links to, to documentation of how the, how the tree bank is annotated and so on. So it's like that for every tree bank in UD. And now, now let me talk about the application that, that, we've, uh, that we're providing to, to use those models. Um, as I said, it's a simple application, uh, web, uh, web form basically, where you where you just paste your text, click a button, and get parsed output. Um, the output can be viewed in three different ways, either kind of raw output, which is table separated values, simple table, or kind of a nicer version of the table, or you can view those sentences uh, transformed into images of trees. And uh, it's just uh, on the, it's just done in the web browser on the client side using JavaScript library. And um, the application includes a file upload option, it's kind of hacked in to, to provide support for, for a switchboard uh, as it was presented uh, by Emmanuel and explained why the file upload has to be there. Um, this is what it looks like. Again, um, you can see that uh, there is a pre-selected model check PDT that, uh, that's a default option. Um, the REST API is unchanged between versions of UD pipe one and two, which allows us currently to run both of these uh, as backends with one front end. So, so the UD pipe application, the front end gets a request. And if the request is asking for some old model, uh, it runs UD pipe version one. If it's uh, asking for current, or it just says uh, na language name, like uh, analyze Czech or analyze English, it runs the latest UD by version two. Um, the, as I said, uh, everything has defaults. So the default of the whole application is, uh, if you don't set anything, it uh, expects input in check, uh, plain text, and it will do all kinds of processing it can do and send you output in ConLU format. Um, as I was showing before with, uh, with Italian, the, there may be several different models for one language. Uh, so there is always some kind of um, default model selected for that language. So you can only ask for, for a language and don't have to study details of those, of those models. 
and the whole application has some has some in interesting integrations that I want to quickly mention. Uh, one is with our with our project repository. So the software, UDPipe itself, the data models, the embeddings, um, the web service part of the software, they all have records in the repository, which means they get persistent identifiers. There are preformatted citations you can use. So, so we encourage people to cite both software and data. Uh, and uh, there's versioning of all these things. So you can see that uh, when you get to a record uh, for UD pipe uh, models uh, version, you know, from UD 2.5, you will see that uh, it replaces UD uh, models from 2.4, but it is also replaced by, by the latest models from 2.7. Uh, you can still use or cite the older version, but it kind of default by default tells you that maybe you want to get the latest. Uh, another integration is with the language resource switchboard. I will not explain switchboard, but here you can just see how it is integrated. So switchboard was explained a moment ago by Emmanuel. And here you can see that I've sent actually a um, Chinese novel or first part of a, of a famous novel. Uh, to the switchboard and it executed UD pipe uh, automatically. And here you can see the output. So what you saw was live. So it took about three or four seconds uh, to analyze that um, about 400 pages novel. Here you can see the nicely formatted table, as I said before. So it shows you the header. So you don't have to remember what each column represents. And um, this is the this is the UD format, so the Conl Conly U format. Um, and this is the visualization of the trees. Uh, again, it's still the same table, only represented in, in this form of dependency trees, uh, drawn by the by the web browser. Um, and you can see that uh, if you click at a node in that tree. Um, it will still show you the same information as that uh, as that table. So clicking here shows again. See that was that was the columns in the table, and you can save the image uh, to your disk, uh, or you can save the the whole processed output, of course. Um, so that uh, yeah, there's one more thing I want to show here. These lines uh, in the in the header of each sentence, that's um, kind of enhancement uh, motivated by by our web application that we've added metadata for kind of fair data principles to be able to better reproduce. So the users who get these this data find out uh, where the data comes from, which tool it was analyzed by, which models, and so on. Uh, uh, well, not explain other integrations. There are integrations with the uh, Clarin Germany WebLift workflow tool and LabScript, which is American workflow tool. And just a very quick view of one more integration with uh, with desktop operating system. Um, I just want to show this as a motivation to, to explain how easy it is actually to integrate web service. So you can see Microsoft Word. I just selected a sentence. And in the menu of Microsoft Word, I found a command to run it by UDPipe. And the command just uh, just replaces the sentence uh, with uh, the already familiar table. So it takes the sentence, sends it to our web service, gets the, back the output, and uh, pastes the output back uh, in the Microsoft Word. This integration works with any uh, any editor on the platform, so, and uh, it's just uh, an example. And this is this is what's really happening. So it's one line shell script basically. This is just an example of how easy it is to integrate the web service into any kind of uh, research environment that anybody is using. So to sum up, um, we are providing openly accessible service, providing state-of-the-art quality and speed. It's no demo, it's a real production service, but we limit the usage to non-commercial use. Uh, and that non-commercial use comes with no strings attached. You don't have to register, you can just run things um, as long as capacity permits. 
and um, it can analyze lots of languages and in half a year with new universal dependencies it will be again more languages and more models and the interesting feature of the new software development is that uh, actually for vast majority of users it's better to use the web service than trying to deploy it themselves because the because of the software constraints of the deep neural networks, you really need a huge uh, GPU to be able to run it the way we, we do. And, uh, and to get back to shock a little bit, uh, um, the services are provided uh, to some work packages. They are used in uh, task 3.3 and uh, 4.2. Uh, it's still ongoing experiments on um, on how to actually combine the, the UD pipe service with some pre and post processing. So not much to say currently about the results. And here you can see that uh, this is a table of uh, shock services proposed uh, as a sustainable service to EOSC and UD pipe is one of them. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, is there any quick question? We are running a bit late, but if there is a, an urgent question, please just raise your hand or type it in the chat. Okay, seems no question for the moment. So I will just move to the next speaker just for a matter of time. Thank you uh, for, for your presentation. So our, our next speaker is Davor Davidovic um, from the Ruder Boscovich Institute. And it will present the um, Daria thematic service uh, in EOSC. Uh, Davor, the floor is yours. We can see your slide. <clears throat> Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, I will uh, give you a um, short introduction of how we, from Roger Boschkovich Institute, were involved in a, um, in, a, in a work, in a research concerning Daria involving in the EOSC, uh, in the EOSC uh, story. So I'll be, it will be a more general uh, presentation of what we have done so far and uh, what are um, our some future goals. Uh, also my colleague Sevace and Carlos Scala uh, has been involved uh, or are still working at their, at their current and previous projects. Uh, I'm also involved with, uh, inside an EOS Hub project and I, I'll put more focus on what we have done there. Okay, uh, before I start, I'll just give a, a, a short overview of, uh, of the kind of um, uh, research uh, workflow, which is more or less applied to every research discipline, but for now with the focus on the digital art and humanities. So the first step is because you all are aware that uh, the, the, the data that's coming from digital art and humanities are of different origins. So the, that there is a born digital data, the data that are uh, produced directly in the digital format, like uh, uh, research papers or the video or the, some 3D models. But there are also a, a, a large collection of, of, uh, of physical data, the, 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 the hard copies, let's say that has to pass through the process of uh, digital uh, digitization uh, before they can be uh, used and exploited in uh, using a modern uh, computer, uh, different computer tools. So this, this is the first process. Then once we have a data in some digital, digital format, then the next step is uh, data archiving and storing the data on some reliable um, uh, storages uh, the, 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 in the order repositories. So once the, the data is stored, the next step is the how to access data. So we want to retrieve uh, certain data. We want to browse, search, uh, and exploit our data. So the, the example of this, uh, probably the, the best known is Europeana, which actually 
goes through the different repositories and uh, and uh, gives you a data you are looking for. The, the next step that we are currently more interested in is the data analysis part. So once we you have access to your data, you, you, you retrieve data that you are interested in, then you can start different analysis on the data. For, for instance, uh, visualization of the data, uh, applying different machine learning tools, uh, trying to find interconnection between the data, some data pre-processing, et cetera. And final step is the knowledge discovery. So uh, from this uh, obtained data analysis, you at the end want to uh, want to extract some new knowledge and, and publish it and make it make it available and um, um, available to to other users. Okay. Uh, so what we what we uh, what we actually the the which part is, is the project we will involve uh, is targeting is basically these steps two, three, and four. Um, within the Daria, so probably all are most aware of what the Daria is, uh, the, so the digital research infrastructure for the arts and humanities, which is more like a, it's small to be described as a network of people, expertise, information, knowledge, technologies, uh, gathered from different uh, member countries. Um, the Daria is a, huge community with 19 uh, member st uh, states and almost 200 uh, different research uh, um, and uh, research organization, acad academia, museums, uh, archives, etc. So uh, within the Dariach and my institute, we start joint uh, research in Late in 2008, with preparing the Ariach project, we were involved uh, in this uh, preparatory phase of the Daria. Then we uh, jump in again in uh, 2015 with two Horizon projects, DJ Engage and Indigo Data Cloud. In both of these projects, we were involved in the in the development of different uh, services tailored and aimed. Uh, but particularly at the digital art and humanities research groups. And the end, uh, currently we are working, uh, we're participating at the EOS Hub project, which is basically uh, a joint of these previous two projects with Gen Engage and Indigo. Uh, the EOS Hub is, is going to, to end in 2020, but it will be extended uh, due to the Corona crisis. So what we have done in the in this uh, project. Uh, so the first in EJ Engage, it was the per first project. The goal of the project was to include and, uh, and engage the, the, the different research communities and push them toward the open science common. That was uh, the, the, the buzzword on the naming of that time of the open science. One of the uh, research community was the, the, the Daria and digital science communities. And we, with the five other partners, were in charge of uh, establishing the Daria Competence Center, which is a kind of ritual center uh, with a main goal to widen the usage of different federated services, mostly based on the cloud uh, cloud technologies uh, for the digital art and humanities uh, research domain. So the main at that time the 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 the, the, the main the, the goal was to, to strengthen the collaboration between the EGI, which provide the infrastructure and the Daria, who provide uh, the, the data or the, 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 the research need. Uh, of, of course, increase the number of different services that, uh, that are used by the community, but uh, can be hosted on advanced uh, e-infrastructure of, uh, offered by EGI. Uh, the in general raise awareness of benefits of using such a uh, large uh, pan-European infrastructure in the in the in the in the general community, and provide access to different uh, cloud resources. <clears throat> the second project was we were not so much involved with the Daria, but to produce some soft uh, some some solutions, some services for the Daria. Uh, the Indigo Data Cloud was the the aim of this was the to, it was more software oriented project. It was to, to develop an open source 
uh, platform providing data and computing solutions for the different scientific communities. Again, the Daria who was in, involved in the project. Uh, in the project, uh, we developed uh, a nice and easy to use service that allows the, the user uh, to easily uh, uh, on automated way deploy in venue based repository in the in the in the cloud so the the user does not have to or the the, the, the his research group or he doesn't have to to possess uh, a, a storage resources nor the compute resources everything is done automatically on the remote cloud sites and finally, the last project, the EOS Hub, which started in 2018, it's a, it's a huge project with 53 countries and more than 100 partners. Uh, we are in charge with, with Staki and GWDG uh, to maintain, uh, uh, on, on, on establishing or on maintaining the Daria thematic service, which uh, maintain and integrate uh, specific uh, services for digital art and humanities communities. Uh, we start the project with uh, three main sub-services, which are basically the results of the EG Engage and Indigo project. So they are all that they are all joined together and um, put under one uh, under one umbrella called thematic Daria thematic service. So there is a Daria Science Gateway, uh, then this Invenio based data repository from Indigo Data Cloud Cloud and the Daria repository maintain and run and develop by GWDG, which is officially a Daria EU uh, repository. Um, <clears throat> uh, within these services, so the, the Daria Science Gateway is like kind of a central service. It's a central, it's a, it's a web-based portal, uh, which is uh, serving as a central point uh, to access the the different cloud uh, services. Uh, and this portal also hosts uh, various um, services or applications or tools that are uh, tailored for, that, that, that were tailored for a specific uh, research group within the Daria community, like a semantic search engine. Um, then the database in the cloud with uh, a collection of Bavarian dialects from our, our, our Austrian Academy of Science. Uh, there is a simple cloud access service, which allows the, the, the simple execution of, uh, of application of the, of the script uh, on the, on the, in, inside the virtual environment, inside the virtual machine. Um, also, um, so in order this service to be uh, effective and operational, um, in the background, it relies on different EOS, EOS Hub generic services like um, authentication authorization service, uh, federated compute and storage, general storage resources, application database, uh, training platform, and, and the other services. Um, <clears throat> if you take a look at the organization of the services within the EOSC, uh, we have a uh, we have kind of a divide of a, on the on the service layers. Let's say it's not a, like a like a official one, but it can be easily divided and then be more understandable of what is what. So the the first is portfolio management is just a, a portfolio of the application that actually exists. Uh, the the pre production environment uh, it's a collection of the services like a like a which. Uh, are federated core services, like uh, services that can be used by any other uh, service, like uh, like uh, authentication authorization service, so that user doesn't have to, or the, the 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 developers of the service doesn't have to apply their own own uh, authorization mechanism, but it can be used this federated one. Um, the help desk system, the the monitoring, the accounting. Uh, the, the 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 software repositories etc. Et so this is like, like a ground level. Then we have a generic services which are like a more advanced services um, <clears throat> general, uh, for data processing, accessing, and preservation. Both of these services are not uh, domain related, so it can be used by any domain. That's why they call it generic. Uh, an example of these are the, the, the cloud infrastructure, the the, the storage, the databases, the 
orchestration of resources, the high performance computing, etc. And finally, on top of that, we, we build our thematic services, one of which is direct thematic service as part of the, the EOS Hub project. Um, how the direct thematic service are integrated? So we have a, I mentioned before that the, the several uh, applications and services like the Direct Science Gateway, uh, DB08 Cloud is, is a collection of uh, uh, dialects, uh, repository in the cloud, semantic search engine. And they are all uh, connected partly or, or fully with the different EOS Hub services like a federate service, a generic service, a collaborative service, which are provided by, uh, uh, by uh, pan-European uh, uh, infrastructure providers like EGI, EUDAT, uh, which provide more on the, on, the, on, the, on the hardware and software and Indigo providing both uh, only uh, a software stack for the services. Um, why is it important when building your service to integrate with the with the with the services offered by the by the uh, by the research communities like that the free I mentioned um, is that it's easier to uh, to um, provide to your service the sustainability, so you don't have to worry about. Uh, uh, will you uh, will and when when you can uh, uh, where, where you can provide your resources on which infrastructure uh, you can provide uh, you, you can improve interoperability between your services because you're using these generic services and you are following some uh, certain patterns um, increase visibility uh, of course uh, easily add new functionalities and features to your services. Um, open your service to a wider community. And uh, what's also important, uh, uh, allow easier data and application sharing uh, between community, uh, inside the communities, but also between the different, uh, different communities. So what are next steps? Um, can, so you, can you go to, towards closure? Sorry to... Is just Sorry? for a matter of time. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, okay. If you were going to. Oh, no, I just have a few more slides. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, as you can see, in this previous project, we were mostly focused on the uh, um, a store, a storing and accessing data, so the, about the storage, more or less. And we are more interested in what about the, 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 the analysis part of the, of the data. So we have a, the, 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 the round table at the beginning of 2020 and we have a short survey and basically show that at least in Croatia, but I, I think it can be a stretch to, to, to a general population that people are more and more interested in using uh, uh, a more advanced uh, analysis tools like a Python or UPython notebooks. So most of the users express interest. Maybe they don't know it, but they wish to learn and they, they heard from somebody or they heard around that people are mostly using it. It's very handy and it's easy, easy to learn. And um, so we, we decide to go in that direction. So our next step uh, will be to uh, extend and onboard the, the different data analysis services. And the first one will be a, a UPyter kind of service. And this is a very handy already existing EGI notebook, it's called, and from EOS Hub, uh, which allows that you negotiate and you get uh, a community uh, deployment. So the idea was to uh, establish and then start a, a, a new uh, EGI notebook for the digital art and humanities that will be like a general notebook, but will provide the functionality of uh, the end user don't have to install uh, the Python, UPyter and all other libraries and tools that are required to run their experiments. They don't have to, uh, uh, acquire uh, a storage and uh, compute infrastructure that, that all automatically provided by EGI notebook and they can easily access it via web browser and uh, interactively use it uh, uh, remotely on the on the cloud infrastructure and thank you thank you Dabur there was just a quick question from Jan in the chat. Uh, it was in which countries uh, you have done the survey so, about Croatia? 
Yeah, it, it, it's only from, from Croatia. Yeah, it, okay. it was a Daria community from Croatia. It was a local okay. event, so unfortunately okay. I don't have the other results. Okay, thank you very much. So Dan, the word to you for your last uh, slides on the common thematic services. Yeah, we can see your slide then. But you are muted then, if you are speaking. Dan? We can see like this. Okay, this now is, yes. This is <laughs> yes. <better>. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry for this. So, in the interest of time, I will not go through the complete presentation. Uh, I just go. Yeah. So, the title of my presentation is Common Thematic Services. And common is not only that these thematic services uh, played both a role in EOSCAP and in shock, but also it underlies my assumption or my claim that uh, trying to make thematic services, common thematic services, so sharing them over multiple uh, communities can be uh, very advantageous from the perspective of uh, resource sharing. Um, now let's go on. I probably have to skip a few of these. Uh, so, uh, the EOSCAP, uh, the really big behemoth of the behemoth of projects, as it were, uh, very large. But what did it do for uh, thematic services or thematic competence centers or for communities? Well, it allowed to integrate such services with the central. Um, services like AI or cross-community metadata discovery, which is all fine, et cetera, but it didn't do anything for extending um, thematic service uh, functionality or trying to uh, generify it, only stabilization and integration with core services. Um, which is fine, of course, but it's not, it, 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 it assumes that all the thematic services are already uh, fit for purpose already, and, and that's often not yet the case. Now, SHOCK, uh, a much smaller project, although I have to say it's, it's the biggest uh, thematic cluster project for the social sciences and humanities that, that existed. It not only includes the, uh, the humanities and Clarin, uh, but also the social sciences and uh, the um, cultural heritage network, ARIES. So for, for a social sciences and humanities cluster project, it's pretty big. Um, it sees as its, uh, uh, how do you say, its, its uh, assignment to uh, create the SSH part of EOSC, so the SSH cloud, um, taking care of integration of the um, SSH services in EOSC, taking care of service sustainability in that context and to um, define an appropriate SSH governance structure to make that all possible. Um, let me see, I could be able to skip this. Uh, this is a slide I think that Pavel already showed. It is uh, part of the inventory of uh, the uh, shock projects that uh, uh, we are discussing to get uh, integrated into, uh, into EOSC. Uh, there are quite a few of them. Uh, you have seen a few of them presented here. Uh, there is one surveycodings.org of which there will be a, uh, a separate presentation uh, tomorrow. And let me skip this one. It's not a uh, thing. So service generifying and or adapting for new communities. Um, within EOS Cup, uh, by the nature of the project, this was limited to using fixed patterns, I think. We have seen this morning 
a, an example of what uh, was done there for uh, communities in B2 Find. And the same was happening in B2 Share. So implementing community specific metadata schemas, but more than that did not happen. Within Shock, there are more opportunities adapting services uh, for the broad SSH. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's what we are doing in uh, task 36 of shock uh, together with the other shock stakeholder infrastructures to find use cases and setting up prototypes both willem with uh, the, the vcr and emmanuel with the switchboard have uh, spoken about that but also there are already quite a few services that were created and that can be that are ready to be used also outside the social sciences and humanities. One of uh, the examples I wanted to mention there is uh, the Stars for All project, nothing to do with uh, the social sciences and humanities. It's something that came on my path because I've also a small task in yet in EOSCA. And um, an interesting project, and they are able to use virtual collections uh, registry just out, uh, out of the box. So it's a lo really low hanging fruit for them. Now, common thematic services. So um, from the perspective of broad usability, sharing of resources, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera, I think both EOSCUP and the shock approach are needed. So integrating with uh, central services as AI, as uh, uh, metadata harvesting, that's all fine. Uh, uh, but you need some motivation there. And that's where I, why I think it's uh, very useful to invite communities with their services uh, to take place at the table in what I call the bigger e-infrastructure projects as was, uh, uh, as is EOSCUP and what will be EOSC future uh, next year. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we also need further service enhancement and generification of uh, thematic services and currently that's a matter for shock but I expect that in the future also further community projects are, are needed. Uh, but although and there I want to challenge a bit I think the e infrastructure project I think with relatively little investment uh, some of these services can be made uh, more generic and uh, applicable also outside their their origin domain. Now this was to be my last slide, but these are the discussion topics. Uh, but since uh, the time is short, maybe it's better to ask if there are still questions in the audience before we take one of the yeah. uh, questions here. Yeah, so first of all, is anyone in the audience uh, with some question for any of our speaker or all our speakers? <laughs> I remember you can use the chat or you can simply raise your hand and we will give you the word. It seems not. Um, I, I had a question um, before that I was going to make to Willem, but mm -hmm. I think it might be uh, of interest for, for all the services that we mentioned today. And you, you partially touch it down also in your slide, which is mm -hmm. the topic of sustainability. So um, now EOSCAB is ending, uh, shock is going on still a little bit, um, but um, which is, the, so which are the plans? I mean, that does, do the different service, thematic service that we have seen today have already um, some sustainability uh, plan for the future after this project have ended? Because I think this is uh, a very important yeah, point. Essential, essential. Uh, yeah, shall I, shall I try to answer that from, from shock yeah. perspective? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So, um, as I said, shock is uh, sees it as it 
Ireland's assignment to create the SSH part of EOS. And part of that is also to look for sustainability of, uh, let's say, the shock project uh, product. So the services that are built within uh, shock, but also services that are considered essential for the SSH that are already existing or were extended within shock. Well, one of, let's say, the examples of a, a service that, that uh, is not being, uh, how do you say, extended within shock, but is uh, uh, used within shock, that is a UD pipe that Pavel showed. So it's a, on our, let's say, hit list uh, for, for uh, ascension in, uh, in EOSC. As it were, what, what form that take, we do not know yet, huh? but, but it's clear that we need to come with a list of services that need to be uh, considered for, for, for perpetuation, as it were. Um, the, let's say that we also have a baseline there, and the baseline is that uh, every community that is, uh, that, that, that is at the origin of one of these services, so for instance, clearing for the clearing, uh, uh, switchboard or the Claring VCR, uh, Claring will remain responsible, but we are, um, let's say, making extensions there that can go beyond the scope of Claring. Yeah? And that is, for instance, why in that list that uh, uh, Pavel showed, but I showed, we have a Claring switchboard, but we also have a shock switchboard. Ideally, these should fall together. Yeah? So but you never know. So in that case, in that case, you should find some kind of accommodation. It will always be advantageous to share source code, of course, or to share uh, uh, expertise, or even to share the operations team, because it does not make that much difference to run a shop switchboard or a uh, clarin, uh, clarin switchboard but mm -hmm. there needs to be then a kind of exchange of, of maybe not uh, uh, economic resources but at least some some kind of an agreement on, on where the where the effort is going to come from yeah uh, yeah because i suppose even if apart from the development even just running the operation will require some some effort in the future, also for support or maintenance, uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you will also have that problem with some of the services in EOS Cup. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's that that's a general problem, not, not huge, just huge for these. Huge investments, right? Yeah. We saw Claudia this morning presenting B to Find, yeah. with all the uh, let's say the the curation effort that is involved there. Yeah. Uh, so this this keeps being uh, being being uh, being a problem, and we are still pushing the uh, how do you say the, the um, yeah the solution forward. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think we are getting a little bit more closer in in trying to let's say from from the bottom up perspective, trying to find some collaborations, right? So if at the cluster level we are able to get some collaboration with, for instance, between Clarin and Daria about uh, the, the support for the switchboard and what has already been achieved support for the uh, shock open marketplace, for instance, uh, where there is already some agreement uh, about, uh, uh, you say, maintenance beyond, beyond uh, shock itself then that's fine. But uh, I think it, 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 it's even more easy than, than a top-down approach here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else still has comments on this. So Jan, for instance, Jan, I saw you were in the audience. You can talk, Jan, if you want. Uh, I'm afraid the Jan. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I, I was not oh, sure yeah. how to unmute myself. <laughs> so, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. No, I think, um, I mean, I just, just one comment. Uh, I, I, I believe I, I probably mentioned that when we had this big uh, 
first shock meeting. You know, we are, I, I'm involved in this uh, European language grid project, which uh, I think several of the problems that you mentioned, Dan, are mm -hmm. sort of similar. Um, I mean, there is no solution, uh, at least not yet in the ELG either, you know, especially about the sustainability. Um, uh, of course, the ELG is really meant for commercial use by companies. So it might be easier uh, to, to come up with some scheme, um, how to make it sustainable. I'm actually not part of that considerations within the project. I just know it's going on. And uh, the project has been just extended until mid 22. And by then there should be something like, uh, you know, either an ice bowl or some other type of uh, company or mm -hmm. nonprofit or something that will run it uh, um, and will, you know, will be somehow sustainable uh, from the commercial use of the platform. But, uh, but of course it might not apply here uh, that well, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, unless it's classified as uh, another infrastructure uh, to which people can possibly have, uh, have you know, money in their, in their grounds, like, like you now can have in Horizon. 2020. Yeah. But, but I, I don't know. I mean, um, so, so, so maybe a discussion with uh, Georg or, you know, the other people, uh, Stelios, uh, could, could, uh, could give some insight what, what's their thinking. And, and maybe you can, um, you can have a chat with them, I, I would say. I mean, that, that's all yeah. I wanted to say. Yeah. And let's say from, from the perspective of collaboration, because you, let's say, purposefully presented yourself, or at least Pavel did, as a uh, Clarin, but also as a Daria uh, center, right? So this allows you to achieve some uh, synergy and do, do things in a bit more, um, let's say, um, uh, efficient way. Um, and what I also see is that some organizations, some centers combine the function of or want to combine the function of a clearing center, but also being a SESTA center. Uh, so let's say they're looking for ways of using the same repository system uh, to, to take part in both infrastructures. Uh, that, well, that's something we would like to do as well. Uh, the um, but um, but the partners, I mean the partners here in the Czech Republic that uh, joined Linda, uh, but from the Daria, uh, you know, perspective, have usually already something installed, and some of them want to integrate it with their institution and not with us. But certainly there are some smaller partners who will actually use our repository. And our plan is also to harvest metadata from everyone, even if they have their own uh, metadata. Mm -hmm. So have uh, like a level two VLO or what, you know, I, I don't know how we will call it, but you know what I mean? Like having yeah. at least national uh, ag aggregation of metadata. Uh, now, now you have to understand that uh, we have all the three national libraries, I mean, the two national libraries and the Academy of Science library with millions of items uh, in, in um, you know, in their collections, uh, because the national library is huge. And uh, we, we are not completely sure yet whether we will be able to, to handle all of that. Um, so it's yeah. sort of distributed even locally at, at the moment. I mean, certainly they won't uh, uh, switch to DSpace. Um, no, because you know, they have an installed base. That's that's. What they have a doing. they have a huge installed base. They invested yeah. a lot of money into software development of yeah. uh, what they call the digital uh, Czech digital library. It's called the Cramerio system. It, it's pretty good for libraries, I think. Uh, so so we don't mm -hmm. even want to push them. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but at least we would like to do something on the metadata level. I mean, we haven't done it yet, but we, we have prepared a schema, a draft schema, which should fit, you know, the people with visual data, like the National Gallery, which is part of it, um, you know, the, the libraries, uh, the bibliography databases, and the language databases. And then we will see whether that can be combined. Yeah. There was also a comment from Richard uh, on the chat. Richard, do you want to make it loud? Just before we close, we are running a bit late. You can unmute yourself, yeah. Okay. 
Richard? We cannot hear you if you are talking. Okay, I, I, I don't know, we cannot hear you, so I will read the comment from yes, the chat. Read, read. Yeah, <laughs> which was, could sustainability be uh, a pricing model for member states? Yeah, that's actually what is being done, for instance, in, the, in, in some infrastructures, huh? but at a, uh, we say, thematic level. So, uh, Clarin, Daria, that, that kind of infrastructures, they, they get money from member states to run. And uh, they, they, the amount of money is dependent on the economy of this of, of a country. And so, so the countries are contributing to the, uh, uh, to the infrastructures already. Okay, yeah. Yeah. But it's... Uh, yeah, it's uh, probably not in. It's probably not enough to keep to to keep all of the services that are being created within the the infrastructure projects alive. And that's so why it, we it are can, still. It can, it can help probably, but not to cover all all the costs that are. If I got yeah. right, the opposite. Yeah. At least that's what I think. So, is there any other? Yes. Hi, Richard. <laughs> yeah, it was Richard. Oh, <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> took a while. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I it was, it was mainly a, a question, comment, uh, or, or forward thinking. Yeah, I, in, in what you have said that the previous speaker have said, it is, it is, of course, the the member states are, are contributing to the maintenance of the infrastructure, but uh, sustainability um, is, is, has, to, has to be, excuse, excuse my very English term, has to be baked into, into um, the cost to maintain this uh, and posterity um, with, with the money invested into creating these uh, various thematic systems. And then suddenly to find that uh, you have to make a decision as to what stays and what goes, it sort of is counterintuitive to, to to open science. So there, once you once you once you begin to fund these very very valuable and useful and needed um, services, there has to be a an understanding, a long long term understanding, that the funding around these services need to be need to be uh, maintained or the month the, the money needs to be maintained so that these services can continue to be provided to the research community at large otherwise we'll be sort of right back where we started which is you know not all research data will be available to to the masses mm. well there there is a difference maybe between data and services here I mean, data, keeping data afloat is something that we, let's say, many think they understand. It's uh, uh, long-term persistency is something that has been, uh, how do you say, uh, already for a long time. Uh, but services is something else, especially if you need in the air, it, it can be quite expensive. And uh, I mean, there, you, you have such a concept as creative destruction too, huh? so that things have to disappear before new, more successful things can can come uh, on the stage. Um, so I don't know. It's difficult, of course, to find some mechanism that that can do that in an efficient way. I mean, in industry, such thing exists. If it doesn't sell, it disappears. Uh, here we have to be perhaps a bit more careful because uh, we are dealing with, uh, with, with research, with science, and uh, uh, there's not that much money going around. Uh, so huge investments have to be, uh, uh, say, have to be carefully, carefully handled. But 
there also needs to be a mechanism by which services can disappear, I think. I don't know what you think. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, 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 I agree that uh, there there has to be. We can't fund the entire. We can't. We can't fund everything. There has to be uh, some point in time where we we say, well, okay, uh, this works. This works. This works. This is useful. This is useful. This is being used. This is being used. And and, and this isn't create some sort of a metrics where we are able to identify those uh, those. Uh, services, yeah, and and, yeah. and I must I must admit that I equate uh, the the entire uh, life cycle of research from beginning to end as services. So I'm sort of including all of that um, in you know from beginning to end, which is actually creating the data that becomes useful. So, but but my point being is is um, Yes, there has to be some sort of a some sort of a mechanism matrix that says this is useful, this is not useful. We can continue to fund this. Maybe we should not continue to fund this. And this, and this, as you said, it's, it has to it has to be it has to resemble uh, the private sector as, as well. Uh, maybe not as, as, as strict, but certainly begin to look at it in terms of sustainability. Hmm. Okay. I Good. think we have to close. <laughs> yeah, somebody knocking on the door. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Virtually knocking on our doors. Um, so i like yeah. to thank all the speakers uh, and all the attendees for participating to this session. Um, we will be uh, attending more session in the next days. So stay around and participate to the event. Yeah. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.